Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So AI, it's been all of the buzz, so much so that yesterday on June 5th, uh, NVIDIA reached a $3 trillion market cap. It surpassed Apple and came close to becoming the number one stock in the S&P 500, overtaking Microsoft. <laughs> wow. Uh, today, we want to discuss the potential opportunities to still make money on the AI trade, and it may not be exactly what you expect. We'll be looking at a commodity with surging demand due to its essential role in construction, defense, electric cars, wind turbines, the power grid, and AI. But to delve deeper into this, I'm gonna bring on Max Porterfield. He is the CEO of Kalinex Mines to give us an inside look at the red metal, copper. Uh, Max, before we get started, first, welcome to the show. And can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your professional background? Yeah, thanks so much, first of all, for having me today. I've uh, got, you know, I've been at, at Kalinex Mines for a decade. Uh, exploring northern Manitoba, Canada for base and precious metals. Uh, so that's to my my, my near term background. And then beyond that, I was also with um, in, in the mining business with Uranium Energy Corp and Gold Mining Inc. They were also in that space. And then before that, I, I had a background in raising capital that invested uh, in these type of companies. So my entire career has been specialized in natural resource investing, whether it be on the buy side or on the issuer side, driving these discoveries forward. Uh, so long-term always been kind of drawn to the commodity space. Awesome, thank you for that. So in today's interview, I wanna to touch on three main topics that will be important to gain a deeper understanding um, of the world of copper. I know copper has been seeing a massive run and it's getting the interest of a lot of people. The three things that I wanna to touch on are the electrification of the world, the global infrastructure and wars, and then various ways to gain exposure to copper. Um, for the viewers, I will have timestamps in the description to all the questions that are asked. Um, and at the end, I would also like to know how you are positioning and Kalinex Mines are positioning into this ever-changing uh, landscape. So let's go ahead and get into it. We'll start off with the electrification of the world um, with the global push towards electrification and the transition to renewable energy sources. How do you see the role of copper evolving in the landscape? And then what are some of the key challenges and opportunities for the copper industry as the world moves uh, towards that greater electrification? Well, first things first, I mean, all of this is driven by government policy, whether it be uh, policy to, to go to war with another country over any, any particular reason. Uh, usually that's a fight over natural resources or it has been historically in the past, uh, or is government policy drives the electrification of the world, uh, really getting away from oil and gas and um, kind of the pollution that surrounds that and replacing that with batteries. And batteries obviously are metal intensive. Copper is a key metal to that. And then on the AI standpoint, you know, this AI revolution that's taking place is going to be driving huge demand for data centers. And that takes electricity. Electricity takes copper because copper is uh, one of the best conductors in terms of metals. Uh, and that's why it's so critically used around the world. Uh, in terms of the struggles that we're going to have as an industry, meaning that is on the supply side because you've got government policy driving demand and driving demand to a finite point in time when this needs to all happen. Uh, this is no different than when government policy drove the need for catalytic converters for all, for all vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, and that all, every one of those catalytic converters needed platinum. So you had a huge industrial demand suddenly put on a smaller metal in terms of market. Uh, and that led to a big appreciation in price because there was no substitute for that need. And you have the same going on on a much, much grander scale, whether it be from infrastructure, AI, electrification, or wars. And you know, in wars, obviously, there's a lot of destruction, a lot of things need to be rebuilt. And then the uh, the mechanisms to fight those wars demand a lot of base metals. Uh, more recently, you've actually seen the US military make investments in Canada into mining operations. Uh, and that shows you how critical these metals are around the world. But at the end of the day, it's a supply side problem because while all this demand is being poured on to copper as a whole, you've had a lack of investment in exploration and development of new copper mines. And this is not a, a scenario where you're going to have supply response instantaneously. The average timeline for a discovery to a producing mine is 10 to 12 years in the copper space. So again, you've got a huge demand coming online. The challenge is meeting the supply that's necessary that's driving that all that, and to meet all that demand that's coming on. Given that uh, increase in geopolitical tensions and conflicts 
around the world. How are the how do wars and global infrastructure projects um, impact the demand of supply of copper? And then are there any potential risks uh, and implications for the copper industry uh, in that context? So geopolitical risk is a big thing in uh, in all metals, all commodities. This is where you're sourcing that that metal or that oil or, or whatever you're looking for. And what is the risk associated to that supply? And what is the impact to a lack of supply to your overall economy? Uh, so again, that's going to be absolutely critical on no matter way, which way you look at it. If you look in terms of global copper supply in particular, over 30% of the world's copper supply comes from uh, Chile and Peru. So those two countries as a whole, again, are kind of like the OPEC of copper, right? So everyone's heavily looking at those countries. So socialist uh, kind of regimes coming into place there do have impacts on output of copper production. You've seen that be implicated in the past, and you've seen that over the past 24 months starting to occur as well. You've had a, a number of strikes at existing mines, and that is going to lead to destruction in current supply, as well as supply that's supposed to be coming online. If you look at the richest copper grades in the world and the most valuable you know, copper mines in the world, they come out of the Congo and in Central Africa, the DRC. I've personally been to the DRC to go visit the mountain gorillas. That's the last time going to the DRC. It was a great experience, but I don't want to be an operator, right? I don't want to put my staff at risk of operating a jurisdiction like that. But again, it's a, a very high grade jurisdiction in terms of the, the richness of the, the minerals there. Uh, but again, the geopolitical risk is unsatisfactory and that can knock off supply. If you look at Russia, for example, Russia's 4% of global copper supply. And of course the invasions and, and kind of the sanctions against Russia will take that supply offline for the rest of the world for the most part. So uh, that's really the risk associated, you know, from a geopolitical standpoint on getting these metals and, and where these metals come from that everybody really takes for granted in their everyday lives. What are some of the various effective ways for investors to gain uh, exposure to copper? And can you discuss any of the roles that uh, equities leverage to copper, such as mining companies or ETFs um, that provide that exposure? I mean, and also maybe dive into timeframes too. We've already seen copper make a big run. And, you know, is this the start of something bigger uh, in, in, you know, for the next five, 10 years? Or, you know, is this something that's going to be more shorter term? Yeah, so first things first, getting exposure to metals in general, there's very few ways to do so. Uh, obviously, more traditionally, you could stack the metals. Uh, there's metal stackers out there in terms of gold stackers or silver. Uh, I don't recommend stacking copper. I mean, it's very, very heavy. Uh, it's, it takes a lot more space than, than gold or silver does, but there are people that actually do do that. Um, that's more of the antiquated approach. There's obviously security risk around that, even though I don't think anybody's going to come into your home to steal the copper, but you do see people stealing the copper roofs and you'll see copper thefts become more and more prevalent. Mm -hmm. Now, the more traditional way to gain exposure to copper outside of playing the copper futures market would be investing in equities that have exposure to copper one way or another, whether that be in the exploration, which is companies that are exploring for or have discoveries in in-ground resources that they're growing uh, that have that underlying metal, whether it be copper, gold, silver, or even a mix of all of those in one deposit style, um, or generating cash flow from existing mines that give them instant exposure to those rising prices. So typically, if you're investing in an equity, you're going to be leveraged inherently to the underlying commodity price over the you know longer term, uh, and that's because as commodity prices increase, the margins of a company will expand. You get margin expansion because you're product that you're selling for is going up, while all things typically considered, your production costs are remain relatively fixed or are rising at a lower rate than the underlying commodity price is rising. So when you have that occur, you have the equities typically outperform the underlying commodities. And that's a great way to make investments in the metals is by investing in the miners or the explorers uh, to that end. So how are you positioning into the copper market? How is Kalinex Mines positioning into the copper market? Um, and maybe if you can break down, because you, you mentioned producers, you mentioned explorers, and kind of the difference between between those two and where we kind of fit in with that. Right. And really, when you're you're kind of building a business around these type of opportunities, you got to take a long-term look. I think the, the shorter-term 
kind of moves occur when uh, you have a, a big move in the underlying commodity price, but then you don't have management teams that have had a long period of time working on that that said discovery. Um, and then everybody kind of rushes into those opportunities. So you really got to pick your, pick your spots and make investments. And what I see, again, going back to your previous question at the end there, sorry, I didn't address it, but it was, we're in the early stages of a long-term bull market for commodities, uh, in particular for copper, uh, based on everything we've discussed today. And so we've taken a very long-term viewpoint in building a business around that here at Calinex through exploration. And that's what I think is the most exciting part about the business is where you really have a vision to create, go out there and explore, and you're creating value for investors in for the future by defining and discovering these different type of deposits. And that's where really the, you can get big moves in these underlying equities is on the discovery phase, particularly when you're making discoveries on the backdrop of a rising metal price environment. So with Calinex, we've always focused in a tier one jurisdiction being here in, in Canada. I'm an American uh, by background, now a dual citizen, but Canada is a tier one jurisdiction globally uh, and is a resource rich nation that's supportive of the development of natural resources, particularly in Manitoba, where there's over, been over a century of mining in the area that we're actively exploring. So again, reducing risk by going to a safe jurisdiction and further reducing risk by exploring in proximity to infrastructure in mining communities that are supportive of new discoveries being made. Oftentimes, and actually you wouldn't realize this, but do you know when the last mine was permitted in the United States? I don't. It was approved in 2008. Oh, wow. Sorry, 2009. So again, a long time coming and very, very rare. And at the same time, you have the governments driving more demand to come on, right? But they're kind of cutting down the industry by not approving these new projects. So you really want to have your project in a jurisdiction where you can advance it. And there's a permitting regime in place and a support of, of mining. In addition to that, the area that we're exploring is known for exceptionally high grades. Our rainbow discovery, which is a deposit that we discovered in 2020 and have grown over the past several years, and we announced a resource which really outlines how much you have and the volume uh, and the, how rich it is, uh, outlined that rainbow is one of the highest grade copper discoveries not just in North America, but truly on a global basis. It rivals the type of grades that you see in Central Africa. So you're able to have those type of high grades in a safe jurisdiction where it's you don't have that not in my backyard mentality. And that's really how we position Kalinex to take advantage of this long-term secular bull market for base metals. Max, I want to thank you for coming on. I want to also, uh, if you can let people know how they can learn more about Connex and um, where they can potentially follow you if they have more questions. Um, and then if there's any last closing statements that you want to close off with um, about this world of copper. Yeah, certainly. So to find more information, you can visit our website at kalinex.ca. That's C-A-L-L-I-N-E-X.ca. We're also active on all the, the known socials. In uh, our contact information is there, so you can directly reach out to myself or any of my colleagues to have a conversation about what we're doing. Uh, we also trade in the United States under the OTCQX exchange and the ticker CLLXF. And in Canada, our primary listings on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the ticker CNX. And to really sum things up is, you know, it's a very, very exciting time to be in the base metal space, driven by these macro trends that are all favorable, the really tailwinds. Uh, behind us that are going to be driving the consumption of copper going forward in a big, big way. Uh, so we're excited to be a part of that and, and meet that demand. Max, thanks again for coming on. We really appreciate it. Thanks again for having me.